Okay, thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for an opportunity to speak here. And I should relieve the feelings of the audience. It is a hard day, uh, if not yet night, but it's already closed to uh, later afternoon. And so I'm not going to speak about uh, anything really advanced or really difficult. Uh, so uh, the uh, subject of the talk uh, is essentially a master thesis of my uh, student, who is this charming lady, uh, which was defendant uh, the last year. So in case of doubts, if you believe that you don't understand something because it appears to be too simple, uh, it is indeed uh, that simple as it appears. So uh, I will uh, talk about the following situation. There are two flavors of, uh, in which the theory of linear ordering differential equations in one uh, 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 exists. One is that of systems of first order equations uh, where the uh, right hand side is defined by a matrix and another is that of higher order scalar differential equations. Uh, the system, the case of the systems is uh, perfectly understood. Actually it was uh, by, in works uh, uh, definitely by the time of Poincaré and Dulac, the situation was quite clear. Uh, 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 and different kinds of classification uh, were suggested and realized. Uh, now, uh, the classification of differential equations uh, was not that obvious. As, uh, actually, it was only considerably later in the 1930s when Frobenius uh, coined the notion of uh, equations of the same type. He didn't call them equivalent, he didn't introduce the words uh, like equivalence relation, but he coined this notion uh, and, uh, well, basically established the algebra which is required to treat uh, this situation. This algebra is fairly general, uh, very nice, and we'll talk about this. Uh, but somehow uh, the classification uh, was never attempted. And uh, besides, uh, uh, there, is a there was a serious question about how exactly you should formulate the problem so that the answer would be interesting uh, and uh, non-trivial. Uh, so uh, we'll discuss a little bit various uh, possible uh, <coughs> uh, cases. Then uh, we'll, show, we'll prove some result which is an analog of linearization for differential equations. Uh, and uh, then we'll discuss the final answer and uh, have some look ahead of what this uh, business can be a precursor for. So let me start with this, uh, just by recalling the uh, syllabus of the second undergraduate year uh, in mathematics. So uh, we have a differential, we start with a differential field with a usual derivation. Uh, well, uh, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, I will need only a few examples. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, rational functions in one uh, very complex variable. There are meromorphic germs. There are, say, formal Lorentz series, and the derivation is the usual derivation in the variable t. So uh, nothing uh, cruel or unusual. Now, uh, this differentiation naturally extends on vectors over vector spaces over this field and on, on matrix, matrices over this field. So we can differentiate, apply derivative to matrices and deviate uh, all their entries simultaneously. Now, if you ha we have a matrix, which, well, for aesthetical reasons, I, uh, I consider n times n matrix, but uh, write the Lie group notation. Uh, so this matrix uh, with entries from our field defines us a right-hand side of the differential equation, uh, which in the matrix form uh, is written like this. And if we want to write it in the usual scalar form, it will be just a system of linear ordering differential equations uh, with uh, non-autonomous systems because uh, the coefficients of uh, the matrix do depend on T. 
uh, it is convenient together with uh, such a matrix system, uh, such a system of first order equations, consider the associated uh, matrix equation. Now, its solution should be a non degenerate matrix function, but usually uh, entries of this solution are not from our original field. Uh, for several reasons, uh, so we need somehow to extend uh, our field to uh, to obtain solutions of linear systems. Uh, okay, that's uh, what what we ha have to do, and uh, still, uh, uh, I would like to focus on the local case when, unlike uh, the. Uh, Mirror, uh, rational functions which are globally defined on the uh, complex projective line, we work rather with uh, coefficients uh, corresponding to germs or formal series around the origin. So it will be our local, our theory will be local. Uh, and uh, the, the main, uh, of course, be, being a person from analysis and singularity, I mostly uh, love the case where uh, the field is just the field of fractions of the ring of holomorphic germs. Uh, okay, uh, there are, so the classification of uh, such objects uh, was known, and actually, I don't know, maybe this goes slightly beyond uh, the uh, syllabus of the second year. So if uh, our coefficient matrix is holomorphic, uh, that's non-singular, uh, then the solution exists uh, in the uh, same uh, field of holomorphic germs. So in this case, we don't need the field extension. And this, of course, is a trivial theorem which, for, which is proved uh, just by, um, okay, in any course, uh, meaning that solution of a system of differential equations, trajectories of vector field are uh, non-singular, are analytically depending on, the, uh, on time and initial conditions. So it's the basic existence and solution theorem. Now, if we allow for uh, coefficients which have first order pool, then it turns out, though the uh, proof is not uh, so obvious, that the uh, solution exists if we extend the class of uh, holomorphic germs, and we have to add to it uh, a few powers, complex powers, and the logarithm. This is called the so-called Nielsen class. Uh, and, uh, well, we, we have to, to, to join them. Now, uh, these, the corresponding differential equations have a first order pool, are called Fuchsian. Now, uh, the principal example uh, of a Fuchsian system is just the Euler system, uh, which is uh, an, uh, an analog of the uh, equation, the simplest equation, uh, uh, dx over uh, dt, is equal to lambda x over t. So it's the first order pool. We have a coefficient lambda, and everybody can, of course, integrate this equation. x of t is uh, c t to lambda. So we have uh, in the uh, matrix situation the same uh, answer. So it's just uh, x has to be the t to the matrix power, which is defined formally as exponential of lambda logarithm t. Now, the Fuchsian condition is not uh, necessary. There are some systems which still admit solution uh, in the same Fuchsian, uh, Nielsen class, but which have uh, poles of higher order. Such systems, contrary to uh, any grammar, any uh, semantics of the English language, are called regular. Uh, so regular does not uh, mean uh, non-singular, uh, but well, that's the termin terminology which uh, exists for more, more than 100 years, and I'm, I would be the last to suggest to change it. Uh, but still, uh, it is not uh, so easy to identify uh, non-Fuchsian regular systems. Um, I do, maybe there are some algorithms, but definitely going beyond the second year uh, calculus. And generically, a Fuchsian a system which exhibits a pole of order greater than two would have solutions which are uh, quite uh, wild, of exponential asymptotic, and so this is the so-called irregular case. Uh, so this is uh, the classification by uh, bestiality of uh, singularities of differential equations. Now, 
what is the equivalence relation? How we are going to classify them? <clears throat> One can think of several local flavors of such classification. Uh, in any case, we, what we want to do is uh, we want to uh, change variables in a linear way. Well, linear systems should be transformed by linear transformations. So which, uh, in the matrix uh, settings, this means that we change the variables by uh, multiplying x from uh, h uh, from, uh, to, from, to the right, and uh, h should be an invertible matrix uh, <coughs> over our differential field. So in coordinates, this simply means the transformation like that. It is easy to write down the transformed system, how you write the differential equation for z. Well, that's the computation, which simply says that you apply the Leibniz rule and then substitute. So as a result, you get the new function, uh, b, which is almost the linear transform of the previous function, but still it has an additional term, uh, which is basically a matrix logarithmic derivative. So uh, classification of linear systems differs from classification of matrices over a field uh, because of this uh, logarithmic de uh, <coughs> derivative. This uh, term is absent only if we are talking about systems with constant coefficients. And that's why differential equ uh, equations, systems with, over, with constant coefficients are uh, so nicely treated by the usual linear algebra. Uh, okay. Uh, then we just say that the two equations are gauge equivalent and gauge transformations, uh, like I described, obviously form a group. So we can multiply by a composition of matrices, we can multiply from the left by inverse matrix, we can multiply by the identity matrix to do nothing. And so uh, that's uh, the, the most familiar situation for anybody who tries to classify things. There is a group action uh, on our space of objects and uh, we need to describe the equivalence classes. Still, there is, because we are uh, working in the analytic case, uh, there is a smaller group which uh, still acts on our linear system. So that is the group uh, which uh, consists of holomorphic and holomorphically invertible matrices. To apply uh, transformations from this group is, uh, makes a lot of sense. The uh, holomorphic transformations preserve uh, many things that are destroyed if we apply uh, meromorphic transformation. So, for instance, the order of pole will, be no, will not be changed if we apply holomorphic transformation. Uh, and, uh, well, one, one can also consider the formal analog just by uh, uh, looking at only at the uh, formal uh, Laurent series and uh, acting on them by formal Taylor uh, invertible matrix uh, functions. Uh, so, well, the uh, classification problem in its standard setting is to describe the simplest uh, normal forms to which you can reduce uh, a matrix by suitable classification uh, transformation from the given group. So the beginning of the answer is very simple. So if we have a non-singular matrix function, then we can reduce it to the trivial form, but either by holomorphic and uh, uh, therefore by meromorphic transformation. If we have a Fuchsian system, then there are two cases, resonant and non-resonant. In a second, I explain what it is. And uh, they uh, can be uh, ex uh, reduced to either Euler equation like this, uh, or something more uh, complicated by uh, holomorphic transformation, and uh, to the Euler equation always by meromorphic transformation. So we see that meromorphic classification is indeed much more coarse. It does not uh, allow us to identify certain subtle features of differential equations. So here is trivial means that uh, the equation takes the form uh, derivative is zero. Euler is what I already wrote. Polynomial means uh, Euler plus some polynomial uh, terms uh, with a suitable matrix polynomial. And uh, integrable, uh, well, integrable means integrable. You can write down explicitly the solution in the form of uh, non-commuting uh, of uh, non-commuting uh, product of two uh, powers of non-commuting matrices. 
Now, uh, what is resonance? Uh, the resonance is uh, a, a condition which is imposed on eigenvalues of the matrix lambda, which is the residue matrix. That's the coefficient, matrix coefficient before the leading term. So if we have a pole of first order, it's simply the residue matrix. And it is non-resonant if no two eigenvalues differ by an integer number. If uh, they differ, then this case is called resonant. Uh, okay, so uh, or maybe I just uh, uh, say some, uh, about those two uh, lines in red. Those uh, lines in red are uh, start, uh, the start of real, uh, re uh, real analysis, real intrigue, because uh, this is the situation where uh, the formal classification uh, is different from the analytic classification. And if anybody heard about the uh, uh, Stokes phenomena, uh, then that's here where you meet it. Uh, well, if uh, you have, uh, and this you, you observe even in the non-resonance case. In the resonance case, uh, the situation is even more complicated. You need to uh, apply a preliminary some ramified gauge transformation. So in short, uh, this is uh, the subject that be belongs to the second half of the 20th century. Uh, it will not appear in my talk except for the uh, last uh, slide. So uh, let me now review uh, the theory of differential equations of high order, what it is. So usually we write uh, systems of uh, equations of this type uh, in, the su in such form. So there are linear homogeneous equations of order n uh, with time-dependent coefficients. And as before, I will be mostly interested uh, in the case where the coefficients are local near uh, the origin. So of course, uh, the naive point of view is that so the two theories should be uh, exactly the same because uh, any such system can be reduced to a system, any such equation can be reduced to a system of first order differential equations by just introducing uh, the uh, new variables as subsequent derivatives of uh, the variable y uh, so that the, the first n equations uh, will uh, have this standard form regardless of what we uh, start from, uh, and uh, the last equation will be derivative of the n minus first coordinate is equal to minus uh, the, uh, the, uh, what you get from this equation. Conserv uh, conversely, one can always uh, reduce any system of first order equations to a linear one scalar equation uh, for each variable separately. So how you do this, so for instance, uh, uh, you uh, differentiate your system of equations and you notice that once you apply derivations to this uh, side, you can uh, use the Leibniz rule and produce a sequence of matrices so that high derivatives of x will be some new matrix a a a AI, which is obtained recursively from the initial matrix by uh, this law. Now, uh, so if, for instance, we want an equation for the first component, we look at the uh, elements of the first column of uh, those matrices. Uh, over the field K, they form n-dimensional space, so there must be, uh, if you differentiate n times, uh, you'll have n plus one vectors, which must be linear dependent over the field, and so there should be a linear combination between them, which is exactly the equation which we look for. Uh, this, equation, uh, 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 this equation is simply a uh, linear combination between uh, higher derivatives. Uh, what is uh, missing in this uh, procedure of mutual reduction is that uh, it, is, uh, it destroys the, uh, it is, excuse me, it is, uh, not respected by gauge transformations. If we apply gauge transformation for the system in the companion form, that's with the, those uh, speci specific uh, conditions, then of course it will be destroyed. So uh, we have no, uh, we have to develop classification for uh, such systems separately. Uh, how we can transform uh, linear equations of higher order? So if we, uh, 
are allowed to make a linear transformation, then because our variable is only one scalar, so the only uh, possibility is to multiply it by uh, a function from our field, which is clearly too small, which it will produce in either group, but it will be too small for any of those purposes. So the natural way out is to allow to involve in our transformation uh, the uh, higher derivatives and uh, change the variable in such a way that new variable z will be a linear combination of y and its derivatives. Now the question is uh, up to what order uh, we uh, want them to, uh, to be. Uh, clearly, if we look at our initial equation, then uh, derivative of order n, and therefore all higher order derivatives, can be expressed as linear combinations uh, of derivatives of order up to n minus 1. So this means that we should not go here in this equation uh, anywhere beyond uh, the, the derivative n minus 1. Uh, but now then the question appears, how would you write the transformed equation? So, uh, well, if you think a little bit, then you uh, realize that uh, the uh, idea of uh, iterating derivation and looking for linear dependence between derivatives uh, can be a little bit twisted to uh, write the transformed equation, but still this is uh, kind of, uh, you don't have a simple formula like h uh, a, uh, a times h minus 1. Uh, what is worse is that, uh, well, the composition of transformations of this uh, type is uh, well defined, of course. You just uh, apply uh, two differential operators uh, to each other. But how to invert it? Uh, inversion, if you uh, are naive, means that you have, to, you, you have to be able to solve the linear differential equation of order m with the known right-hand side z, which is, uh, well, that's a nasty idea. You, all the idea of classification was aimed to uh, get rid of the process of solving differential equations by, uh, to, uh, by, by just reducing them to simple form. And, uh, you realize that this is be because there is no natural group action uh, in this case. Transformations of that uh, form uh, are not, uh, do not form in a, uh, any group. Oh, uh, at least uh, you don't see it and see uh, a posteriori, it turns out indeed that uh, there is no such group. Uh, so, uh, how you should uh, proceed in this case? Uh, so, uh, Frobenius and Ore, Oistin Ore, in the 30s, uh, developed a wonderful theory uh, which allowed to treat such uh, questions uh, in an abstract uh, algebraic way. So, let me just recall uh, the basics of this theory. Uh, they consider the uh, algebra of differential polynomials. That's a non-commutative algebra generated uh, by adding to our differential field one new symbol, de delta, which does not commute uh, with elements of this field. So, uh, well, everybody knows what a differential operator is, so you just uh, here it is what you expect to see. Uh, we can always write any such object as a polynomial in, uh, in D, and uh, with coefficients written to the left from this power. Uh, now, uh, elements uh, from the field, uh, you can consider them as zero-order differential operators, which consist in just multiplying uh, the unknown function by uh, the corresponding coefficient. So uh, there is an action. And uh, well, you can compose uh, differential operators with each other, which means uh, a non-commutative multiplication. Uh, so if you uh, write down two polynomials of this type uh, and open, uh, use distributivity and open uh, all uh, terms, then you will see that sometimes you would have uh, coefficients written not before uh, to the left from delta, but to the right. So you have to move them to exchange the order. And this exchange of the order is done using this uh, identity, which is basically the Leibniz rule. That's uh, how you compare uh, first multiplying function by A and then deriving or first deriving and then multiplying. The, this commutativity identity, uh, commutation identity is the only one that uh, exists in this while algebra. 
Uh, and thus, we see that linear differential uh, equation, uh, equations can be written in the form uh, Ly is equal to zero, where L is uh, 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 in W. Now, our transformations uh, can be now represented symbolically as uh, application of uh, differential operators of uh, well, diff different order. And so, uh, uh, I want to just to mention the connection between operators and solutions. So if we have an operator M, which for some reasons is reducible, that can be represented as a composition or product of two operators, then it is clear that any solution of equation Ly equal to zero will be at the same time a, a solution of equation of uh, M to equal to My equal to zero. Because if uh, L kills uh, your solution, then uh, application of U keeps zero, uh, uh, sends zero to zero. And uh, well, it's just a side remark that actually uh, there are many de de uh, in a differential field. You may easily replace one derivation by another by just multi uh, multiplying it from the left. So instead of delta, we could easily use uh, another derivation. And for many reasons, uh, it would be natural to uh, consider the Euler derivation, which is T delta. I will explain uh, the uh, reasons why this Euler derivation is uh, so much better than the usual derivation. But in principle, this, uh, well, that, that's also not a big deal. I, if you just substitute instead of uh, uh, epsilon, uh, instead of delta, T minus 1 epsilon, in any differential operator, and then use commutativity to uh, reduce all coefficients uh, to, the, to the left, then you can re-expand any uh, polynomial in powers of delta to a polynomial in powers of epsilon and vice versa. So uh, it would, uh, this operation preserves degrees and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what is important is that in this algebra there is an operator, operation of division with remainder. So this is definitely not any non-commutative algebra processes, uh, but uh, this is uh, what, what happens uh, is that if you have two differential operators with orders n and m, and uh, n is larger, then you can uh, construct an operator uh, like this, whose leading term will be exactly the leading term of d. So if we consider the difference, then the leading term disappears. Well, it's exactly the long division of numbers or long division of polynomials, uh, which we uh, apply here. Now, if we iterate this construction, we can uh, divide any operator L uh, of higher order by an operator of lower order from the right and uh, guarantee that the remainder will be the, of degree less than uh, that of M. So that's the algorithm of division with remainder. Now, this uh, turns out to be uh, very nice because uh, in practice, uh, this would allow to re reconstru uh, reproduce the Euclid uh, algorithm of looking for a greatest common di divisor. And what is the greatest common divisor is uh, you have two differential equations. You do not know how to solve any of them, but you can explicitly write down an, an equation for all their common solutions. That's a, is a, quite a, uh, uh, an attractive feature. And uh, moreover, you can uh, uh, represent this greatest common divisor as a linear combination of uh, the two initial equations uh, for suitable u and v. So in exactly the same way, if you have two, uh, for instance, two mutually prime differential operators, then you multi can multiply one of them uh, by something from the left, another by some, uh, something else from the left, and the sum will be the identity. So you can uh, boil uh, uh, two uh, differential equations to a trivial one without uh, derivations at all. Uh, now, what is the to be in the uh, apparatus in the same sense, in, uh, of the same type in the sense of Frobenius. 
suppose that uh, we uh, are given an equation and uh, we want to apply to it an operator h, which sends it uh, sends a variable y to z. The equation mz is the h transform of ly. Uh, if the composition mh vanishes on all uh, solutions of uh, l equal to zero. So we want to find an equation which is satisfied by z. So we just say that uh, I'm looking for a differential operator m, such that m applied to h, y uh, will be always zero as soon as l is equal to zero, uh, l vanishes on y, which means that m h is divisible by l from the right by our agreement, and so m h is uh, k l. To be of the same type means that uh, you, uh, operators L and M are to be of the same type, or one is H transform of the other. When uh, you can multiply uh, L by K from the left in such a way that the result will be divisible by H. Uh, well, it takes just a short time to get adjusted to this uh, kind of algebra. Uh, I have to only to add one thing. Uh, the transform should not kill. Thu shall not kill. That's the commandment uh, which uh, uh, one must obey always. Why? Because uh, if it will kill some of the solutions, uh, then we, do, we, would, we would transform an equation to something of lower order. Uh, so we do not want our transformation to kill all solu uh, uh, solutions of uh, the initial equation. Which means that uh, we uh, uh, have the following definition. Uh, two operators, L and M, are of the same uh, type if there exists uh, H and K, such that MH is KL, and then and in addition, that's the uh, do not kill uh, condition, meaning that uh, L and H uh, operators with equations with L and H have no common uh, solutions. Uh, well, and uh, of course, uh, if we ha have a situation like this, then we can always assume that uh, degrees of H and K, uh, uh, K are smaller than the degree of uh, L and M, simply by replacing them by their remainders, modulo uh, K and M. Uh, if we choose the minimal order, then we see that uh, those two parts uh, are actually the lowest common multiple of operators H and L. The operator, which is represented by either part of this equation, is divisible by H and divisible by L. That's the equation which is satisfied uh, by solutions of H equal to zero and L equal to zero, and we know that this solution is a direct sum. Uh, okay, so now this definition instantly implies that reflexivity and symmetry and transitivity are obvious. You just compose operators and use H as identi identity as H to prove this. Why it is symmetric? Here is the proof. Uh, well, very much like in the, pr the, the possibility of inverting uh, one number modulo the other if uh, uh, they are mutually prime. We have the representation of one, which is GCD of HL. That's our condition. Then uh, we can represent it by the Euclid algorith uh, algorithm by as a one as a linear combination of UH plus VL. Uh, and then we can multiply this identity by L from left, uh, both sides. So uh, what we have is, uh, after some easy transformation, we have an operator whose both parts are uh, uh, both parts of this equation are divisible uh, by H and by L. So they should be divisible by the least common multiple of the two operators, which means that uh, this, common, common, uh, I, but, uh, this common multiple is, has two equivalent representations. So uh, I choose this one, MH, and uh, I write that LUH is equal to WMH. So we have the identity. Well, it's not that yet what we are looking for, but uh, this algebra has no z zero divisors. Uh, the leading term of composition is always the product of leading terms, so you cannot get product of two operators equal to zero. So you can cancel H and uh, arrive at the identity LU is equal to WM, which means that we have started with identity in which M was to the left, L was to the right, 
and we uh, ended up with the, another identity where now L is to the left and M is to the right. So we exchanged the roles of L and M, and uh, we uh, showed that uh, this uh, equivalence relation is indeed symmetry. Now, how to localize our theory now uh, for the case when we don't want arbitrary situation, but we stick to the situation where our differential field is that of meromorphic germs? Uh, well, note that uh, we are dealing with uh, differential, homogeneous differential equations. So regularity of the coefficients, as it was in the matrix case, make, makes no sense. Uh, only the ratios, uh, when the, uh, you divide the uh, coefficients by the leading term, make sense. It's a kind of projective. You need to projectivize them in the right way. And so there are several uh, cases uh, of, uh, uh, in the increasing order of bestiality with respect to the quality of solutions. So there is a non-singular case where all those ratios are holomorphic, non-singular. In this case, uh, you know everything about this. Such an equation can be reduced to a non-singular system of differential equations. It possesses analytic solutions, and it's perfect. Now, uh, it, and you can even guarantee that those solutions have a very specific form. Uh, you can find linear independent solutions of this form. Now, then there is a moderate class of uh, equations which admit salute, solution in the Nielsen uh, class uh, with some powers and logarithms. It turns out that this, is, this happens if and only if uh, the equation can be, the operator can be written as a polynomial in the Euler operation with holomorphic uh, ratios of the coefficients. So this is called the Fuchsian condition. And uh, again, as I, as I said, uh, in, for linear systems, to be Fuchsian is sufficient but not necessary to, uh, to be solvable in the Nielsen class, in the class of uh, moderately uh, weird functions. For equations of high order, this is, uh, the situation is much better. If uh, the equation has solutions in the Nielsen class, then it is always Fuchsian. No, uh, un is, is, uh, no unexpected things here. So non-Fuchsian equations always have exponential solutions. And uh, still, we, uh, are, we need to uh, decide in the Frobenius definition what kind of regularity of coefficients do we want to impose on the pair of operators HK, which conjugate to given equations. So uh, it is uh, like we have to find proper substitutes for holomorphic classification and for meromorphic classification. Uh, so what we should uh, do here. So theoretically, we uh, have uh, the following situation. Uh, first, we can simply uh, let no constraints. Uh, any operator with meromorphic coefficients uh, is allowed uh, to be, to be uh, used to, for transforming our equation. Second, uh, we, uh, for some reasons, we may uh, want that if we are classifying Fuchsian operators L and M, then we want also the, the uh, conjugacies H and K to be Fuchsian. And then there is a, a condition, well, it's a possible even stronger uh, request, uh, uh, that uh, we can use only non-singular equations for the conjugacy. So uh, which of them uh, should be used for uh, classification? Uh, so that was uh, bas basically the subject of, from which the research uh, of Shira began. We decided to, to, to see what we can do and uh, just by trial and, and error uh, see uh, uh, which will give better answers. So the first results uh, are very, uh, easy, were very easy to obtain. So here is the Euler operator. That's the operator which is in powers of the Euler derivation, uh, but with constant coefficients. So this is a commutative subalgebra in my uh, whale algebra. Theorem, any Fuchsian operator is W conjugate to an Euler operator. That's exactly, so without any extra conditions, uh, we have uh, this uh, result. And uh, one can is, uh, verify that the uh, 
fractional parts of those uh, characteristic roots are invariants. You can change, uh, shift them by integer numbers, by, but the fraction parts uh, you have to keep. Uh, so, the, so much about uh, uh, classification without any constraints on the type of conjugating operators. Uh, it kind of kills uh, all, uh, all flavor of differential equations in the Fuchsian case. Now, uh, any non-singular operator uh, can be uh, each reduced to a trivial operator, which is just power of delta. Well, the, the trivial equation has solutions of uh, uh, a solutions polynomial of degree uh, up to n minus one, and uh, any non-singular operator can be transformed uh, to this form by uh, a suitable pair of h k with uh, analytic uh, coefficients. Uh, now, both results are simple. Uh, the catch is that we tried this analytic classification uh, on uh, Fuchsian equations, the simplest possible case, and uh, were completely stuck. So, uh, now I, I just recall the table that uh, I already showed for systems and so try to show you what, what we had seen uh, up to this moment. So if we have non-singular uh, equations, then they, by holomorphic classification, they can reduce to trivial form. So this is a consequence. Now, uh, the last line uh, does not uh, exist because there are no uh, regular non-Fuchsian equations. So fortunately, this line will not bother us uh, anymore. Now, this column, last column, if we replace uh, mirror-morphic classification by W equivalence, uh, then uh, this is exact, uh, exact parallel to the classical theory. So the question is what we should uh, put here to make this uh, uh, middle cell indeed not trivial, non-trivial, so that it would at least uh, distinguish uh, between resonance and non-resonance case. And the uh, proposed answer is we have to uh, use indeed the middle classification between general while and holomorphic. We need Fuchsian things. Well, here it, uh, you start running into problems almost instantly because, for instance, Fuchsian equations, uh, if you consider them modular something, just the remainders modular L, uh, they do not, uh, they are not closed by composition. Of course, composition of two Fuchsian operators is uh, in the, again Fuchsian, but once you divide it by, uh, by even by a Fuchsian operator, the remainder might be non-Fuchsian. There is no control. So it is uh, this, uh, uh, classification which still has to be elaborated and uh, things checked. And in particular, the proof that uh, I gave for the uh, reflexivity, uh, it doesn't work immediately because it uses the Euclid algorithm, which is uh, simply, uh, it doesn't work over uh, Fuchsian operators. The remainders are non-Fuchsian. Uh, so uh, we had to uh, do this, and uh, well, uh, now uh, I will uh, uh, explain. Uh, I do have five minutes, right? Five minutes. Okay. So I will explain the main tool uh, which uh, we used for the study. So instead of writing differential operators as polynomials in delta with coefficients to the left, because we are in the local case, we decided to write them as power series with uh, polynomials in epsilon in differential operator and uh, in powers of t. And of course, to be consistent, we need to write uh, differential uh, parts to the right. So we consider this uh, uh, strange uh, algebra. Uh, uh, without loss of generality, we may assume that actually uh, there is no, uh, so all those terms are indeed polynomials, so the powers of t are only uh, integer. Uh, and uh, this algebra is very much similar to the algebra of uh, matrix formal series, except for uh, when we uh, work with formal series with matrix coefficients, the, those coefficients commute with t, but do not commute with each other. Here uh, we have the situation where uh, the coefficients themselves belong to a commutative ring of polynomials in the symbol uh, is, uh, A, 
uh, e, but uh, they do not commute with the main variable that we use for expansion. Uh, so uh, there is kind of duality, which uh, I, I, I asked different people, uh, have you ever seen such duality? And nobody uh, gave any anything uh, specific. Well, the commutativity relation, of course, is uh, can be easily derived from the commutativity relation in the Weyl algebra. And here is the explanation why, uh, well, metaphysical explanation of why Euler operation is better than the usual derivation. Uh, the usual derivation is uh, a nil potent operator if we cons uh, consider it on monomials. And the Euler derivation is diagonal. It multiplies each monomial by its power. And so you know that in the, uh, in the Lie group theory, there are two uh, extremes. So everything can be represented as a sum of a nilpotent and semi-simple part. And so here, we uh, uh, the working with the usual derivation means working with nilpotent operators, which is uh, very inconvenient. And see, if we work with semi-simple with diagonal operators, then everything uh, go goes on very smoothly. And so uh, we can now uh, do what uh, people did millions of times in uh, similar situations. We can write the conjugacy equation that uh, uh, mh is equal to kl. We substitute in this equation the unknown uh, h and k, and we expand it, uh, the, so we equate the, the, the coefficients for uh, the power series. Uh, definition, the Fuchsian operator is uh, the operator, well, not the definition, it's just uh, okay, it's, it's non-resonant. If it's leading term, uh, it's a polynomial in epsilon, it, it has no eigenvalues different, uh, which differ by an integer number. Theorem, any Fuchsian operator is formally Fuchsian equivalent to its Euler part. So this means that all other uh, powers of t can be eliminated by, uh, by the whale equi equivalence uh, with the Fuchsian operator. Uh, okay, as I said, the proof uh, is achieved uh, by simply taking this identity and uh, where, say, L is our given operator, M, we want to be its, its principal part that is just polynomial in epsilon. And we uh, write down uh, uh, two unknown operators, expand them in a series with unknown coefficients, and substitute. So uh, the result will be a triangular uh, system of equations uh, which has the following form. Uh, uh, okay, uh, what is important then, uh, because uh, your uh, equality uh, involves operators to the right and operators to the left, so uh, when we uh, reduce them to uh, the standard form, uh, arguments of uh, one op each operator should be shifted by uh, the corresponding degree because of this uh, commutator identity with the uh, Euler operator. So we have uh, the system of equations where P0, uh, P1, and so on are known. Uh, eta1, kappa1, eta2, kappa2 are un uh, unknown polynomials. And this number in uh, braces means that we have to take P0 and shift it uh, by the corresponding number, uh, integer number to the right. And we observe that this system has the following uh, very simple form. Uh, it is, uh, it's, and every stage you have something which you accumulate from the previous computations, which is known, and the only equation that uh, has to be resolved is this one, which means that we want to, uh, uh, if those two uh, polynomials, if polynomial P and each shift by J have no common roots, then by linear combination of such polynomials, we can get everything. That's uh, exactly the theorem that I mentioned, that if you have two mutually prime polynomials, then everything can be represented as AP, AP plus BQ. So that's uh, what, we do, uh, what we observe, and therefore all equations in this table are uh, solvable, and we uh, arrive at a formal solution that's a simple exercise to show that it can be uh, it is actually convergent. Now, in the resonant form, 
uh, we have uh, this map which sends eta and kappa pair of unknown polynomials to the linear combination like this. It may be uh, non-invertible because sometimes it has no trivial kernel. Exactly at the common roots uh, between of p and p shifted, which means that uh, the, the uh, dimensions, the degrees where uh, the two uh, roots of p uh, have uh, integer difference. Uh, so this means that we won't be able to uh, kill all elements, uh, all higher powers of t. We have to keep something. The question is what, is what to keep. We, want, we can just say, well, uh, you can keep almost all of them, uh, leaving the result polynomial. What we need is algebra integrability. Uh, integrability means the possibility of writing down the answer in the closed form. Uh, well, that was uh, a heavy task, but eventually we uh, realized that uh, we can achieve Liouville integrability. We can reduce any Fuchsian operator, even in presence of resonances, to a composition of first-order operators with polynomial coefficients. And uh, those polynomial coefficients are linear in epsilon, means that they're first order operators. Uh, their right is free terms are polynomials, and those coefficients are uh, reified. So, in some sense, uh, we can say which, uh, that most of their, uh, their few nominals, only a few of them, few terms of them can be non zero, and this depending on the combinatorics uh, of, possi uh, of resonances, possible identities uh, like this. Uh, and as I said, uh, any differential equation of this form is Liouville integrable, meaning that you can express solutions uh, in terms of uh, integrals. So I come to the conclusion. The conclusion is uh, that uh, first it seems to, uh, that we found a good, uh, uh, thing, a, a good theory that makes uh, important things. Second conclusion is, well, it's, I skip it. Uh, the real challenge is uh, actually that it is only a preliminary step. The great challenge is to uh, try and uh, make this classification for non-Fuchsian equations. And I expect here that uh, a new realization of Stokes uh, matrices could be obtained uh, in the new context, uh, well, not by Stokes matrices, but by Stokes uh, uh, differential operators, something that uh, nobody had seen thus far. Uh, okay. So uh, the next speaker is, uh, well, not exactly like this. We still have a concert. And uh, here is the reference. Uh, it was published just a month ago in a new journal, Arnold Journal of Mathematics, which I advertise as a source uh, venue for publica publication of simple but interesting results. OK, thank you for your attention. question so when you say that this is a normal form it means that there's some unicity in the, uh, the expression well uh, n no no I didn't claim the uniqueness uh, I expect that uh, there are possible some simplifications but still at the same time I believe that uh, uh, some of the uh, some combinations of the polynomials are I well uh, in this theorem are, are indeed moduli, which you cannot change. The intuition is based on some uh, ancient results by Vita Klepsen uh, in his master thesis many, many years ago. But, uh, well, this is uh, something that still waits to be addressed. Would it be a, r a version of uh, real numbers for real? Uh, Excuse me. Uh, for real numbers, mm -hmm. would it be a version of this theorem? Uh, I think uh, real theory is completely uh, parallel uh, to the complex one. We here we don't have to uh, find out characteristic. Ah, uh, no, no, no. No, I, I, uh, up to a certain extent, uh, real theory should not differ from the complex one because uh, we don't have to, to factor polynomials here. We uh, need only to be sure that there are no integer difference between uh, polynomials and its shift. 
uh, uh, but well, to be on the safer side, yeah, I have to, to, to look more at that. Really. Uh, and the subfield of the complex numbers will work no, the technology, of course, can be uh, reproduced, but uh, the question is, say, uh, whether I'm given a real differential equation, can I bring it to such an Louisville integrable normal forms by real transformations? I'm 99% sure, but I need to check. Uh, just, uh, let's see, goes by inspection of the proof. Uh, 